Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shri Zawadekar. I am a software engineer at Intuit. And I'm going to talk today about our journey of running Apache Kafka on Kubernetes from evaluation to production. So uh, I'll quickly go over the agenda of the talk. Uh, we'll quickly talk about why we decided to use Kafka. Why did we choose to run Kafka on Kubernetes? Or why did we think about Kubernetes as the kind of substrate for running Kafka? Um, Kafka on Kubernetes architecture. So how did we think about this? What Kubernetes objects and resources come into play when we are trying to run Kafka on Kubernetes? And then I'll go into details of the architecture itself. I'll try and focus on the problems as much as possible, because problems are going to be common across all of us. Uh, depending on our environments and SLAs and everything else, the solutions to those problems might be different. It's all software. There are 500 ways to solve every problem. So why Kafka? So within Intuit, I work for an organization or a, a team called QuickBooks. Um, Intuit QuickBooks is a monolithic application for, that is used by millions of customers, small business customers. These small businesses use uh, QuickBooks for accounting, payroll, and other financial management. And QuickBooks is a fairly complex application. It's been around for several years now, and it has grown organically. And it, is, it, is, it has tightly coupled modules as, you know, as time has gone by. It has like, you know, gathered a lot of interesting functionalities. But it has become harder to scale. It is harder to do continuous deployments with it. And the goal was to take this big, giant, monolithic application and break it up into multiple microservices. And it's one thing to break it up into microservices, run it on Kubernetes. But then there is this other interesting question that comes up with it. How are these modules or individual microservices going to be able to talk to each other? And the goal, therefore, was to use Apache Kafka for doing this. So Kafka kind of becomes this central nervous system which connects all these individual components and microservices, and they are able to send their data onto the Kafka bus or different topics. Subscribers can subscribe to it. There could be more than one subscribers. Microservices don't need to know about who else is running in the system, and it kind of gives us the benefits of microservice architecture as well as kind of decomposition, and therefore, with it, continuous deployments, and so on and so forth. Why Kubernetes for Kafka? So, I mean, of course, there is, you know, we all benefit from Kubernetes. You know, we have job security if there is Kubernetes everywhere. But, but, but beyond that, the point was um, Kubernetes is becoming the de facto standard for running containerized applications. All the Kubernetes talk that I'm giving you today or everything that I'm talking about today is strictly about running Kubernetes on AWS. So, it, Kubernetes integrates very nicely with AWS. It's very nicely, it's aware of AWS. It has all good features for integrating with other AWS resources, which is really good. And then there are several constructs within Kubernetes which are great for Kafka. Things such as stateful sets, where you have a pod and you have a volume together as one unit, and then you can take this one unit and create n replicas of this. You can have this one unit uh, of a pod and a PVC spread across multiple zones, have them, um, have them run in a configuration where they can always be together, and things like that. So stateful sets were great. Configuration maps, Kafka, like many other applications, is a fairly complex application. It has a lot of configuration that goes with it. You want this configuration to share it across all the brokers. Config maps give you the ability to create one config map and mount it inside all your brokers, so all your N replicas get the same configuration. Secrets, so SSL was important for us. I'll go over that in a little more detail later about, why, about security and how SSL was kind of the key to the way we achieved security. So secret, Kubernetes secrets provided us with a way of using, of creating an SSL certificate, put it into a Kubernetes secret, mount it in all brokers, and again, we got what we wanted. And then the last point about pod and node affinity and anti-affinity. So there are some parts of Kafka which were super interesting from, or interesting from, a, from an architecture point of view, where we did not want two Kafka brokers to land up on the same EC2 instance. We did not want a Kafka broker and a Zookeeper instance to land up on the same EC2 instance. So we wanted to kind of spread them apart for availability reasons, but how do we express that such that it actually is guaranteed that no such pod will actually land up on the same node? We use pod affinity uh, or pod anti-affinity and some node affinities for achieving this. So I'll go over that also in a little more detail. But these kind of basic constructs that are fundamental to the way Kubernetes is made, it, made us the kind of, you know, think about, think very seriously about why we should use Kubernetes as a substrate for running Kafka. Uh, 
And then last but an extremely important point about extensibility offered by containerized environments. So it's one thing to take this big monolith or big um, interesting application that can provide a lot of functionality, has great promise, and install it and get it to run. But it's another thing to kind of figure out how are teams going to use it? What kind of tools and services are needed for the last mile problem? So there are at least two examples where we had these kinds of last mile problems and we found a solution which was in the form of another tool or another utility and all we had to do in Kubernetes was take that Docker image and run it as another pod and now suddenly this last mile problem was easy to solve. So the extensibility offered by containers fundamentally and Kubernetes specifically was amazing in the way we were able to achieve this especially when we wanted to run it in production. So. It was, this was, it was great, like we were like, okay, we thought about this, we think this is a great, uh, kind of a great marriage between Kafka and Kubernetes, this will work well. Where do we begin? So like all good engineers, we looked at Stack Overflow. Uh, sorry, not exactly Stack Overflow, but, but we did a Google search. And, uh, and we found out that there are many other people who think similarly, and we found a bunch of these interesting articles and um, uh, GitHub repos where people talk about running Kafka on Kubernetes. So specifically among them, uh, the one from Yolene, it's a GitHub repo, the slides will be made available, you can find that, but if you search for Yolene, Kafka, Kubernetes, you'll pretty much get there. Um, was really good. If there is someone here, by the way, from Yolene, please get in touch with me. I owe you a drink or, or, or coffee or, you know, it's Christmas season, maybe, you know, gingerbread cookies for all you care. Uh, but this was great. Uh, we found this repo. It was exactly along the lines of what we wanted. It was giving us a multi-zone, uh, or if I had a Kubernetes cluster which spanned across multiple zones, it was giving us Kafka as a stateful set. It ran Zookeeper as a stateful set. It was using config maps for the server.properties file, which is what the configuration for Kafka is. And interestingly enough, it also had shell scripts for actually running these brokers. So this was a little interesting because fundamentally, like when you want to run a broker in Kafka, it is a Java command. It's like Java-M and a bunch of jars and then you know, some other arguments that go with it. Uh, instead of just running that command in the container, it actually had a shell script, and th this command was run, but it also provided a way in which these shell scripts could be you know, customized for our use cases. So it was really, really good that way. So we took these shell scripts, we took this repo, we said, okay, let's see if this even works. So we put this on a cluster, we ran this, basically all of these were YAML files, so all we had to do was take them and do a kubectl apply, and everything was running fine. We did our basic tests, you know, we ran, we created a topic, we ran, tried to write to a topic, it was great, we read from the topic, it was working fine. So it seemed really, really stable. We did a little more than that, where we said, okay, let me kill a pod and see if it comes back up, it was working fine. Let me kill an EC2 instance and see if like the auto-scaling group in AWS brings that instance back, does it go back and join the cluster, and does, it, uh, does Kafka as a software recover from all of this and work fine, and it was really working well. So we were like, okay, this sounds very promising. Uh, we need to show that we have to do more work, otherwise, again, you know, job security, it has to go on for a while. <laughs> so, so we decided to do a little bit of a baseline experiment with this. Look, what, uh, if we take this setup, it is very rudimentary in some sense, it's not production ready, it was kind of day, you know, five or 10 of, of, the, of getting off the ground. What do we do in terms of kind of finding where we are at? So we decided to put the system under a little bit of a load, and this was the experiment that we decided to run with this. So the setup basically had five EC2 instances running Kafka brokers, uh, R4.2 extra large, which are like eight vCPUs and 61 gigabytes of memory, spread across three zones. Um, each broker, the JVM, was getting eight vCPUs and six gigs of memory. Replication factor of three, we never were gonna be able to run uh, without like having three replicas in three different zones. Uh, 10 producers and a message size of 10 kilobytes. The note on the other side basically talks about how we did not have SSL, we did not have background stress. I'll go a little bit about, about what background stress means in details uh, in a little later. But fundamentally, like the Kubernetes cluster did not have anything else running on it. It was only the brokers and Zookeeper that was running on this. And there was no compression. So the data would go in, it would go into a topic, and then consumers would consume from there and it would just like, consume the data as is. And this was what we got. So the end-to-end -end latency that the y-axis represents here is basically the latency measured from the time a producer produces a message, puts it onto the bus, there is a consumer which consumes this message and actually reads, the message itself has a timestamp. The consumer reads this message, 
looks at its own timestamp, looks at the difference between the timestamps, and then it knows what was the end-to-end -end latency that was required for this message to go from the producer to the consumer. And of course, as the producer and consumer were not doing anything else. So there's nothing else in the system. Um, and then looking at the, the latency, this is what we got. So about for 50,000 messages, uh, we were at, you know, on an average at about 35, maybe 40 milliseconds. It was a little up and down. So it was a little concerning that, you know, you should, ideally you would want to have a, like a single straight line because there's nothing else happening. Why do some messages take longer than the other? Um, one of the reasons behind that turned out to be the way AWS handles, uh, the AWS NAT gateways can kind of come in the way of uh, com TCP communication. Uh, fundamentally what happens, that also was the reason why the first packet or the first message always started, took longer. So the first message actually has a latency of about 70, 75 milliseconds. And what we found out was the producer or the consumer is trying to connect with a Kafka broker when that TCP, Kafka is a TCP-based protocol, so there is a TCP connection trying to happen between a, a system that is outside of AWS or outside of the account for sure and trying to connect to the broker. When that TCP connection is actually trying to be established, the, if for some reason AWS or the broker decides to send an ICMP fragmentation needed packet because it does not like the size of the TCP packet, the AWS NAT gateway which was coming in the way would drop these packets on the floor. So the client wouldn't even know, it would just always try to continue to try and establish a connection with a packet size which was bigger than what the broker liked and this communication would always come in the way and the NAT gateway would drop these packets and it was hard to get there. It just so happens that TCP tries out different things as time goes on. So it would try for some time. If, not, if things didn't work, it would try with a different packet size and things would work fine then. But it was a hard problem that we had to run into and thankfully some of these AWS folks were available for us to kind of talk to and they told us about this and you know, God bless uh, TCP, Wireshark and Tracedump and everything. But after that, this was a little up and down but it was still good. Like it was, it was good performance. Like this was more than what, I mean, this was faster than what we were wanting to, to see. So we went around to other engineering teams that were going to use this within Intuit and we were going to talk to them about like what are their requirements? What do they want from this Kafka bus? And after connecting with multiple different teams, this was the final set of requirements that we put together. We were going to have to support a Kafka on Kubernetes infrastructure that is going to have 9,000 messages being sent per second. Five kilobyte message uh, size, like each, each message that would be written would be about 50 kilobytes, but given that we can use compression, we can have the message size on disk would be five kilobytes. The retention period would be seven days. Uh, this was where we, we wanted it to be longer, but given the requirements or given the constraints and the costs involved, seven days was kind of a happy compromise. Three replicas, as I said, we, we always wanted, we cannot have uh, data sitting in only one zone in AWS. They have three zones in every region or the US West region, which is where we were. We wanted all three zones to have one copy. About 200 topics in Kafka. And then the end-to-end -end latency was awesome. Like people were like, we need a maximum, uh, we can, I mean, it's okay if the end-to-end -end latency is 100 milliseconds or less. So again, we were well below the 100 milliseconds. So we could have claimed victory, but we didn't. So based on these kinds of questions, we were like, okay, this is getting serious. We need to figure out how we can now take this one by one towards production. So this was the architecture that finally it came up to. So the master, so this was a Kubernetes cluster that was gonna have three master nodes, one in every zone. So the master nodes that you see here, there's two A, two B, and two C, one master node in each zone. The zookeeper instances, so these zookeeper nodes that you see here, it's an auto-scaling group. This auto-scaling group had five instances. This is, uh, I mean, it has six instances, but only five of them get used. Zookeeper is a consensus-based protocol, so it needs an odd number of instances. So we had five, two zones will have two instances each, and one zone will have one. And this Kafka nodes is another uh, auto-scaling group. There were, given all the requirements that we had, uh, based on some calculations, which I can share with you offline if needed, but we decided to have nine brokers. So nine EC2 instances, one broker on every instance. Um, yes, it means at times that, okay, you know, containerization is all about like, packing many things together, but given the seriousness of how things were, we wanted to be kind of safe uh, than sorry, so we said, okay, let's start with one broker pod per instance, and let's see how it goes. So nine EC2 instances, one for each of these nine brokers in its own auto-scaling group. So it's one thing to have these nine brokers, but the question was, we were gonna have 
uh, requests coming in from multiple different uh, teams or multiple different services that were not necessarily running in AWS. So we needed a public endpoint. And how do you give a public endpoint for the nine brokers? The way, again, Kafka works is that each of these clients, each of these uh, producers or consumers needs to be able to access and directly connect over TCP to each of these brokers. So in order to do that, one option would have been to make all those nine brokers have public IPs, which was not great because if those instances go down, new ones come up, they might change their public IP. We could give them static IP addresses, but again, you know, it might just increase the threat. The security folks were a little une uneasy with that. So it was decided that a better option would be to kind of have another layer in front of all these brokers, and we decided to go with a network load balancer. So this might some be something that will come up if you have Kafka setups on Kubernetes that need to be accessed outside of uh, Kubernetes or outside uh, certain VPC. How would you present each of these brokers? We chose network load balancers, but there might be other options. So network load balancer in Kubernetes or in AWS presents, it's, a layer, it's an option for using layer four uh, communication, TCP communication. This network load balancer sits in front of, or sat in front of all these brokers, and it would know exactly how to communicate with each of these brokers individually. And the way this is very similar to what a NAT is, that the network load balancer has a public IP or a public DNS name, and port P0 would go to Kafka K0, port P1 would go to Kafka K1, so on and so forth. So it's basically DNS name colon port that becomes a unique combination that can uniquely identify each of those nine brokers. So, so this is just a little bit of a recap. So Kafka and Zookeeper run in independent auto-scaling groups. There's one Kafka broker per EC2 instance, and one Zookeeper, um, uh, Zookeeper node per EC2 instance. So let me show you a little bit of this in action. Um, I have this cluster here with me right now. Let me just extend this. Can you guys see? So uh, I have this Kubernetes cluster here right now. In this, you can see that the stateful set, which runs the nine brokers, uh, you can see Kafka, K, Kafka 0 through Kafka 8 as the eight uh, as, as the nine broker pods. There is the PZU 0 to PZU 4, which are the five Zookeeper instances. And then this is the extensibility part of Kubernetes, where we use Yahoo Kafka Manager and Zookeeper Web UI. I'll show the, the actual UIs for doing this a little bit of, uh, in a little later. So there are, um, if, you do, if you look for the stateful sets, there are two stateful sets. Uh, if you look for config maps, there are a bunch of config maps. The broker config is the config map used by the brokers. The Zookeeper config is basically the config map used by Zookeeper, and it has the server dot properties needed for Zookeeper to run. Um, so let's get back. Yeah, I had screenshots for this. I wonder why. <laughs> So, um, okay, so this is going back to the NLB configuration that I was talking to you about. So the NLB configuration took a little time to understand and figure out. Uh, fundamentally, as I said, the NLB basically sits in front of every broker. It kind of acts like a NAT. The NLB has these things called target groups. Um, so we create a, a target group for each broker colon port. A port, so if you see here, port 32400 is referencing broker 0. 32401 is referencing broker 1. So the name of the NLB and that's this port number uniquely identifies each broker. Kafka also needs a client uh, port. Essentially, this is used for discovery. So clients of any producer or consumer needs to be able to connect on a fixed number of fixed port uh, where it goes and says, hey, give me all the Kafka brokers that are currently live in the system. So this is called a client port. So the Kafka client port was port 9094. Uh, so that also kind of became an additional target group in the NLB configuration. So this was great. So we had a Kafka setup, we had a stateful set, config maps, all that good stuff. The NLB was working great. But uh, again, Intuit is a, is a financial services uh, company. We need to talk about security. And in fact, regardless of whether you're a financial company or not, you should talk about security. Um, so two things. First and foremost, authentication. How do we know which producer or consumer is allowed to be able to write to this Kafka uh, endpoint? So there are a bunch of ways in which this can be done. And I wish like, you know, there was time for kind of looking at each and every single option, trying it out, getting some results, and then coming up with the most optimal one. But again, given the constraints of time, the most feasible one that seemed to kind of fit the bill that we had was mutual TLS. So mutual TLS basically requires the brokers to know about every single client that can connect with them, 
and each client needs to know, needs to have access to the broker so that they can present this certificate to the client and say that, okay, I am who I am, check that I am allowed and then let me in and then let me allow, uh, let me publish to the bus or let me read from the Kafka broker. So Mutual TLS was a great way of doing this. It adds a little bit of an overhead when it comes to onboarding clients onto the Kafka instance. So when people, when new clients want to come in and there is a little bit of a manual process where we have to like create a certificate and give it to them and let the brokers know that, okay, there is a new client that you will see, but it's okay for the, requ for the requirements that we had this seemed to be okay. So that, that takes care of two things. It takes care of authentication. It also takes care of the fact that over-the-wire communication is happening over SSL. So therefore, it's all encrypted both ways. So therefore, it makes it super secure. And then what about data at rest? So this is where, again, the, the Kubernetes was awesome. So Kubernetes has, uh, it integrates very well with AWS. AWS has a way in which an EBS volume can be encrypted at rest. All you have to do is create uh, an encryption key in Amazon KMS and then use that key for the EBS volume and tell the EBS volume to encrypt using that. Kubernetes, the storage class object in Kubernetes has an option for doing this. It just it literally is one line which says encryption equal to true and that storage class will then, or when the persistent volume gets created, the key gets created and again, it then gets used for encryption of EBS volume. So we, we basically just use that. So it's one thing to get, okay, the security folks are happy. But then, you know, if you want to do, you know, real traffic in production, we need visibility. We need to know about what's happening on the cluster, what's happening in terms of logs. We need to know about what are the metrics I'm getting. And if something goes wrong, that's going to be my number one place to go to in terms of figuring out what is wrong. So for logging and monitoring, <clears throat> Intuit has, uh, has had a history of using uh, Splunk, and other integrated Intuit services were using Splunk, so we decided to kind of go in the same way, but it also helps with you know, being consistent across the board. We run a FluentD daemon set uh, on the Kubernetes cluster. It's configured to write data to an, a Splunk H, uh, HEC endpoint, and the FluentD daemon set also, each pod takes the logs from each of these instances running in the cluster, takes these logs, writes it to the HEC endpoint, and the HEC endpoint then puts the data into Splunk. Uh, and then Kafka and Zookeeper logs from instances were basically written by FluentD into Splunk, so that way we were getting all these, uh, all the, the requests that we, or all the logs that we wanted were there. And then for monitoring, so again, you know, uh, other applications within Intuit have had uh, used Wavefront, so we kind of continued to do this. Wavefront is a SaaS service that uh, I think last year or a year before that was acquired by VMware. Uh, and it's a great SaaS service. It kind of gives you a good, uh, it stores a time series database and it shows a, a great way of charts and gra showing charts and graphs of the metrics that you've pushed to it. It also integrates very well with pager duty and things like that. So we decided to use that. Um, the metrics had to be collected at two levels. So there's one about the cluster level metrics. So fundamentally, how many nodes do I have? What's the memory and CPU utilization of each node? What about the disk space? And so on and so forth. More at the infrastructure level. And then secondly, application specific metrics. So within Kafka, like how many leader elections am I getting? What's the, what's the latency between my two brokers in terms of replication? What is my GC time and things like that. So application level metrics had to be uh, collected and sent to Wavefront. So for both of these, um, we found ways of doing this. Heapster, uh, I know it's Heapster recently has been deprecated, but Heapster has a way in which it can write data to Wavefront so at the, for the cluster level metrics, we run Heapster. It collects all these metrics and sends, ships it to Wavefront. For application level metrics, we use Telegraph. So Telegraph runs as a sidecar container to each of these brokers. It collects all these metrics, JMX metrics from Kafka and sends it to Wavefront. I'll show a demo of this in a while. Okay, so this, again, I wonder why I have the screenshots, but let me show this right here. So, so to start with, this is the so this is the dashboard, this is the Kubernetes cluster level dashboard within Wavefront. So this particular cluster that for which I'm demoing, it has three namespaces, 23 different nodes, it has 117 pods and a bunch of other information about, you know, pod count by namespace, what's the CPU usage by each of these namespaces, uh, memory usage by each node. Again, giving you a, a view of the way the entire infrastructure or the Kubernetes infrastructure is, uh, is currently um, uh, is currently being used. And then there are ways in which you can go actually, uh, go back in time or find a specific time slot and uh, do this. 
There is another dashboard that Wavefront has which is specific to a namespace. So the, the pods that I showed earlier are running in namespace called Kafka-NS. So for this cluster in the namespace called Kafka-NS, we have 37, contain 37 containers. And then within that namespace, how much is the network traffic, what's the memory and CPU rate, uh, and things like that. And then lastly, the Kafka-specific metrics. So there is, as I said, Telegraph is run as a sidecar container which collects Kafka-specific metrics, sends it to this, um, to, to Wavefront. So currently in my Kafka cluster, there are zero under-replicated partitions, zero offline partitions, which is a good thing. Uh, if this number goes up, we have, a wave, we have an alert that is uh, hooked up with pager duty, which then calls someone. I'm on call right now. I hope it doesn't, it doesn't fire right now, hopefully. Um, and then these are specific uh, metrics, uh, or metrics specific to, to Kafka. So the request throughput here is actual requests of Kafka. Like when I'm trying to uh, write a message or read a message from a Kafka bus, what, what's the throughput that I'm getting, so on and so forth. And then spec and about Wavefront. So uh, Fluentd is used for collecting these logs and shipping it to Wavefront. The other good thing that Fluentd does in this case for us is that it doesn't, it, it doesn't just take the log message, but it also kind of augments it with a lot of metadata about where the message came from, which was awesome. So this may be the actual message that came up from the, from the pod, but it kind of puts a lot of other details like what is the broke, or sorry, what is the pod it came from? So this particular message came from Kafka 7, uh, from the namespace called Kafka-NS, um, from this cluster called Shri Kafka test cluster, which is my cluster, and which is great because now this gives me the ability to kind of drill down into the, met or the logs of a specific pod or of a specific namespace or what have you and then kind of slice and dice all this information if and when something goes wrong. So this was really cool. <clears throat> so this, this was great in the sense that, you know, once the logging and monitoring data was also kind of getting to kind of these, these the final destinations where we, where we wanted it to, we had a cluster, we had an NLB, we had access figured out, we had security figured out, logging and monitoring was great. But there were always these last mile problems. An application, some other team would come to us and say that, hey, we, we want to create a new topic. And the only way we had to tell them was to kind of do these obscure ways of telling them that, okay, here is a kube config, now you, uh, you know, run these kubectl commands, do a port forwarding, and then SSH into the pod, and then run these obscure uh, command line tools that Kafka provides for creating a topic, which was hard, and it was like, it took time and effort, and it was very error prone. So for these kinds of things, again, extensibility of Kubernetes is phenomenal. So we found uh, Yahoo Kafka Manager as this, uh, as a tool that is made available, uh, that is open sourced by Yahoo for doing these kinds of, uh, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of tasks. So Yahoo Kafka Manager was an open, is an open source tool. We take it and run it inside the cluster and it makes it easy because it gives you a web-based front end or a web-based UI for, for doing these kinds of tasks like creating a pod or, sorry, creating a topic, configuring the topic a certain way and things like that. Same with Zookeeper. When people had problems with Kafka, they would look for solutions. And the moment you Google about a Kafka problem, the, one of the most common reasons people will find, or one of the most common problems people will say is, oh, go look at Zookeeper. And getting Zookeeper, getting to Zookeeper was a problem because getting, like Zookeeper also has a, has a command line tool, but it's super hard to use it. So we found a Zookeeper web UI. And it was great to get the Zookeeper web UIs because now we could just go and tell people to go to the web UI and they would see basic information that was stored in Zookeeper. I'll talk a little bit about Argo in a minute, but let me just show this. So let's say I'm doing a port forwarding of, so on my cluster. So this is what the Zookeeper web UI shows. Right now I'm just uh, at one particular path. Uh, called slash bloker slash IDs. So it shows me that right now I have nine nodes in the cluster. That's the Zookeeper's view. And there are other things. What about topics? I have two topics right now called consumer offsets and topic one, that, because this is a test cluster that I have. But other, other information stored within Zookeeper, if people have doubts and questions, this was great to see this. And then, So Yahoo Kafka Manager has something like this. So this shows up again. It's a very bare bones UI, but, but it works great for the use cases that we had about where people can use this, look at what topics they have, look at the lag, configure new topics if they want to create one. So if you do go here and create a new topic, you can create new topics here, configure it the way you want. So this was good because it kind of gave people easy access to some of this information inside the cluster. And then lastly, 
uh, Argo. So I'm biased. I work for uh, a team that built Argo as the workflow engine for Kubernetes. And one of the questions people always had was, even if I have access to a Kafka cluster, how do I do basic operations or basic tests on this cluster? If I want to just do, like, you know, create a topic, write, you know, 100 messages on it, read 100 messages from it, how do I know that this is actually completing and doing well? So we used Argo for this. Uh, as I said, it's a workflow engine for Kubernetes. We created one workflow for basic tests. We created another workflow for a stress test. And we created a few other workflows for specific needs that people had. And now we could share these workflows with people and say that, OK, if you ever want to try out something different, take this as a sample workflow. And you can change it, augment it, create a new copy. A workflow is a file. So we share this file. It's a YAML file. Take it, change it, tweak it the way you want, and run this workflow on the cluster. And once you run this workflow on the cluster, you will be able to get get some you know, visibility into how your infrastructure, how the Kafka cluster looks like, and how it's running. So this was great. So we had the last mile problems covered. People were happy. But what about performance? We started off with this goal that we want to do this with an end-to-end -end latency of uh, 100 milliseconds. So we, after all of this, we said, let's run this performance experiment and, and see where we are with respect to baseline. So this is the, exam, uh, the sample setup for the performance experiment. We had nine instances. Um, R4 2x large, 8 vCPUs, spread across three zones, <coughs> X equal to all, replication factor of three, and so on and so forth. And then the, no, the, uh, this time it was with SSL, so it was going to add a lot more computation for the TCP connection, for the SSL overhead, for decrypting the data and, uh, and everything. Um, there was two types of experiments done with and without background stress. So basically background stress was um, we were measuring the latency between uh, 10 producers and 10 consumers, but at the same time, there were three other producers generating about 4,500 messages and writing them into Kafka. So we're generating a bunch of activity within Kafka and Kubernetes for other things, but measuring the latency for these producers, because that was going to be the common case. Um, and then snappy compression, as the, because uh, I mean, uh, among the compression techniques uh, Kafka supports, we picked one. Uh, we experimented with it. Snappy was the best one for the for the type of uh, JSON objects that we were sending. So we decided to use uh, Snappy, and this is what we got. So the two lines here, the blue one is basically the end-to-end -end latency with background stress. So it is also up and down, um, but some of that is attributed to the fact that there is a background stress. There is a bunch of activity happening behind the scenes, and it's a little up and down. We, need, we actually should go even deeper than what we know of today. Um, but even then, the average latency, if you look at that, is about 37 milliseconds, which is still well below the 100 millisecond mark that we were aiming for. The good, the good part, although, was the red line actually now shows. So once we fix the NAT gateway, I mean, we didn't fix the NAT gateway problem. All we had to do was make sure that the Jumbo frames was enabled across all the components involved. Jumbo frames were enabled on the EC2 instance. Jumbo frames were in, uh, enabled in Calico, where you had to set the size of the TCP, the TCP MTU size. Once it was set to 8192 bytes, um, the, the, like the NAT gateway being a problem in between went away, and we now have a much more consistent red line, which is the much more consistent performance uh, as the baseline. So this was great. This, uh, I mean, yes, there is a little, um, there's some work, mo there's more work to be done in figuring out what, what else can be done to kind of bring this latency even below where it is at. But compared to where we had begun and compared to the goal that was set for us, we were well within that range. So at 37 milliseconds, this was really working well. So if you were to go ahead and start doing this, I would say watch out for these small, uh, small, but uh, some things that can, you know, it can hurt. Uh, watch out for these small uh, tips. JMX metrics are not supported by, uh, directly by monitoring services. You might have to figure out how to convert them between JMX format and some other format that the monitoring service understands. NAT gateways on AWS don't support uh, TCP frag uh, IP fragmentation. Uh, TCP MTU sizes may not be set correctly, so you'll have to go ahead and look at that and modify it if needed. And then log messages. So this happened once where we were, de uh, we were debugging a Kafka problem. We, we changed the log level of the brokers to, uh, to debug, and it kind of overwhelmed Splunk, and like it started throwing all kinds of errors. So the log message rate from the brokers can be very high. So I wish I could give you, a, I could, there could be a conclusion where I make you like super stoked about this and make you run back to, to your offices and install Kafka on Kubernetes. But my high level point is, it's possible to do this. So you can absolutely do this. It's a lot of fun to do this. So just go ahead and try it out. And lastly, thank you so much for being here. If you have questions, uh, we have some time. I'm also available outside after this. And we are hiring at Intuit. Thank you.